So I assume that Norman doesn't need much of an introduction, but Ted's audience is global; it's diverse. So I've been tasked with starting with his bio, which could easily take up the entire 18 minutes. So instead, we're going to do 93 years in 93 seconds or less. <laughs> you were born in New Hampshire. Your New Haven, New, Connecticut. New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> There goes seven seconds. Nailed it. You were born in New Haven, Connecticut. Your father was a con man. I got that right. He was taken away to prison when you were nine years old. You flew 52 missions as a fighter pilot in World War II. You came back to radio、L、operator. You came to LA to、Gunner. break into Hollywood, first in publicity, then in TV. You had no training as a writer formally, but you hustled your way in. Your breakthrough, your debut, was a little show called All in the Family. You followed that up with a string of hits that, to this day, is unmatched in Hollywood. Sanford and Son, Maud, Good Times, The Jefferson, One Day at a Time, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, to name literally a fraction of them. Not only are they all commercially, not only are they all commercially、uh, successful, but many of them push our culture forward by giving the underrepresented members of society their first primetime voice. You have seven shows in the top ten at one time. At one point, you aggregate an audience of 120 million people per week watching your content. That's more than the audience for Super Bowl 50, which happens once a year. Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> And we're not even to the holy shit part. <laughs> you land yourself on Richard Nixon's enemies list. He had one. You're in. <laughs> That's an applause line too. <laughs> you.、Uh, You're inducted into the TV Hall of Fame on the first day that it exists. Then came the movies: Fried Green Tomatoes, The Princess Bride, Stand by Me, This Is Spinal Tap. Again, just to name a fraction. Then you wipe the slate clean, start a third act as a political activist focusing on protecting the First Amendment and the separation of church and state. You start People for the American Way. You buy the Declaration of Independence and give it back to the people. You stay active in both entertainment and politics until the ripe old age of 93, when you write a book and make a documentary about your life story. And after all that, they finally think you're ready for a TED talk. <laughs> I love being here, and I love you for agreeing to do this. Thank you for asking. That's my honor. So here's my first question: Was your mother proud of you? <laughs> <laughs> my mother. What a place to start.、Uh, when I came back, let me put it this way: When I came back from the war, she showed me the letters that I had written to her over, from overseas, and they were absolute love letters.、Mm. Uh, they. <laughs> this really sums up my mother. They were love letters, I, as if I had written them to. They were love letters.、Uh, a year later, I asked my mother if I could have them because they, I'd like to keep them all the years of my life. She had thrown them away. <laughs> That's my mother. Now, the, <laughs> the best way I can sum it up in more recent times is:、uh, this is also a, a more recent times, a number of years ago, when they started the Hall of Fame to which you referred.、Uh, it was a Sunday morning when I got a call from the fellow who ran the TV Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was calling me to tell me they had met all day yesterday, and he was confidentially telling me they had they were going to start a Hall of Fame, and these were the inductees.、Uh, I said to say Richard Nixon because Richard Nixon. <laughs> I don't、uh, think he was on their list. The、uh, William Paley who started CBS, David Sarnoff who started NBC,、uh, Edward R. Murrow, the greatest of the、uh, foreign correspondents. Patty Shevsky, I think the best writer that ever came out of television. Milton Berle, Lucille Ball, and me. Not、so、bad. I, I called my mother immediately in Hartford, Connecticut. Mom, this is what's happened. They're starting a Hall of Fame. I tell her the list of names and me, and she says, "Listen, if that's what they want to do, who am I to say?" <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> 
That's my mother. I think I, I think there is that kind of a laugh because everybody has a piece of that mother. <laughs> and yeah, and the sitcom Jewish mother is born right there. So, your father also played a large role in your life, mostly by his absence. Yeah. Tell us what happened when you were nine years old. He was uh, he was flying to Oklahoma uh, with three guys that my mother said don't. Uh, I don't want you to have anything to do with it. I don't trust those men. That's when I heard, maybe not for the first time, stifle yourself, Jeanette. I'm going. And uh, he went, and it turns out he was selling, uh, picking up some fake bonds, which uh, he was flying across the country to sell. And, but the fact that he was going to Oklahoma in a plane, And it was going to bring me back a, 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 a 10-gallon hat, just like Ken Maynard, my favorite uh, cowboy, uh, wore. You know, this was a few years after uh, Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic. Planes were... I mean, it was exotic that my father was going there. But when he came back, they arrested him as he got off the plane. That night, uh, Newspapers were all over the house. My father was with his hat in front of his face, manacled to a detective. And, uh, and my mother was selling the furniture because we were leaving. She couldn't have, didn't want to stay in that state of shame in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And, and, uh, and selling the furniture, the house was lo loaded with people. And in the middle of all of that, some strange horse's ass <laughs> put his hand on my shoulder and said, well, you're the man of the house now. I'm crying, and this asshole says, you're the man of the house now. And I think that was the moment I began to understand the foolishness of the human condition. So <laughs> it took a lot of years to look back at it and feel it was, uh, it was a benefit. But well, it's interesting that you call it a benefit at listening to a, you. A benefit in that it gave me that springboard. I mean, that I could think uh, I, it, how foolish it was to say to this crying nine-year-old boy, you're the man of the house now. And, oh, and then, then I was crying. And then he said, and men of the house don't cry. Oh. And I... <laughs> so, uh, it, it, I'm, I look back and I think, That's when I learned the foolishness of the human condition, and it's been that gift I've, I've used. So you have a father who's absent, you have a mother for whom apparently nothing is good enough. Do you think that starting out as a kid who maybe never felt heard started you down a journey that ended with you being an adult with a weekly audience of 120 million people? Oh, I, love the, I love the way you put that question. Because I guess I've spent my life, wanting, <laughs> if anything, wanting to be heard. Uh, I, th I think it's a simple answer. Yes, that was what sparked. Uh, well, there are other things too. When my father was away, uh, I, I was fooling with a crystal radio set that uh, we had made together. And I caught a signal uh, that turned out to be Father Coughlin. On, on, uh, yes, somebody laughed. <laughs> But not funny. This was uh, a horse, uh, not a horse of that, who was very vocal about hating the New Deal and Roosevelt and Jews. First time I ran into an understanding that there were people in this world that hated me because I was born to Jewish parents. And that had an enormous mm, mm. effect on my life. So you had a childhood with little in the way of, of strong male role models, except for your grandfather. Tell us about him. Oh, my grandfather. Well, here's the way I always talked about that grandfather. Uh, there were parades, lots of parades when I was a kid. There were parades on Veterans Day. On pre there wasn't a President's Day. There was an Abraham Lincoln's birthday, well, George Washington's birthday, and uh, Flag Day, and, and lots of little parades. My grandfather used to take me, we'd stand on a street corner, he'd hold my hand, 
and I'd look up and I'd see a tear running down his eye. Uh, and he meant a great deal to me. And he used to write presidents uh, of the United States. Every president, every letter started, my dearest Stanley, Mr. President. And he'd tell him something wonderful about uh, what he did. <laughs> but when he disagreed with the president, he also wrote, my dearest Stanley, Mr. President, didn't I tell you last week? <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and I would run down the stairs every now and then and pick up the mail. We were three flights up, 74 York Street, New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, I'd pick up a little white envelope reading, you know, Shia Seacall at this address. Uh, and that's the story I have told about my grandfather. They wrote him back oh, in the envelopes. I mean, they, they wrote back. Uh, but I, I, I have a film of myself going way back to uh, Phil Donahue and, and others before him, dozens, literally, of interviews in which I told that story. This will be the second time I have said the whole story was a lie. The truth was my, father, my grandfather took me to parades. We had lots of those. The truth is a tear came down his eye. The truth is he would write an occasional letter, and I did pick up those little envelopes. But my dearest darling, Mr. President, all the rest of it is a, is a story I borrowed from a good friend whose grandfather was that grandfather who wrote those letters. Mm. And I, I mean, I stole Arthur Marshall's grandfather and made him my own. Mm. Always. I, when I started to write my memoir, even, even this, how about that? Even this I get to experience. Uh, when I started to write the memoir and I started to think about it, and then I, I, I did a reasonable amount of crying. And I realized how much I needed the father, so much so that I appropriated Arthur Marshall's mm -hmm. grandfather. So much so, the word father. I have six kids, by the way. Mm. My favorite role in life. Uh, it and husband and my wife, Lynn. Uh, but I, I, I stole the man's identity because I needed the father. Now I've gone through a whole lot of shit and come out on the other side, and I forgive my father. The best thing I, the worst thing I, the word I, I'd like to use about him and think about him is he, he was a rascal. Mm -hmm. The fact that he lied and stole and cheated and, uh, and went to prison, I submerged that in the word rascal. Well, there's a saying that uh, amateurs borrow and professionals steal. I'm a pro. That you're a pro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that quote is widely attributed to John Lennon, but it turns out he stole it from T.S. Eliot. So you're in good company. <laughs> um, you, I want to talk about your work. Obviously, the impact of your work has been written about, and I'm sure you've heard about it all your life, what it meant to people, what it meant to our culture, you heard the applause when I just named the names of the shows. You raised half the people in the room um, through your work, but have there ever been any stories about the impact of your work that surprised you? Oh, God. It surprised me and delighted me and from head to toe. Uh, there was an evening with Norman Lear within the last year uh, that a group of hip-hop uh, impresarios and performers and the, the Academy put together. Uh, the subtext of an evening with was uh, what, uh, what do a 92-year-old Jew, then 92, and the world of hip-hop have in common? Russell Simmons was among seven on the stage. And when he talked about uh, the shows, he, he wasn't talking about the Hollywood uh, 
George uh, Jefferson or in, in, in the Jeffersons or the show that was a number five show or the, he was talking about a simple thing that made a big uh, uh, impact on him. Yeah, no, an impact on him. I, I was hesitating over the word change. I, it's hard for me to imagine, you know, changing somebody's life. But that's what he, the way he put it. He saw George Jefferson write a check mm. on the Jeffersons. And he never knew that a black man could write a check. And it, he says, just impacted his life. So it changed his life. And uh, when I hear things like that, little things, because I, I know that there isn't anybody in this audience that wasn't likely responsible today for some little thing they did for somebody, whether as little as a smile or an unexpected hello, that's how little this mm. thing was. Mm. You know, it could have been the, the dresser of the set who put the checkbook on the thing and George had nothing to right. do while he was speaking, really. I don't know. But... So in addition to the long list I shared at the beginning, I should have also mentioned that you invented hip-hop. <laughs> well, um, I want to talk about... Well, then do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> accomplishment. You've led a life of accomplishment, but you've also built a life of meaning. And all of us strive to do both of those things. Not all of us manage to. But even those of us who do manage to accomplish both of those, very rarely do we figure out how to do them together. You managed to push culture forward through your art while also achieving world-beating commercial success. How did you do both? When I hear that, uh, here's where my mind goes when I hear that recitation of all, all I accomplished. This, is, uh, this planet is one of a billion, they tell us in a uh, uh, in a universe of which there are billions, billions of universes, billions of planets, uh, which we're trying to save and we require saving. But anything I may have accomplished is... You know, my sister once asked me, uh, what she does about something was going on in, uh, in Newington, Connecticut. And I said, write your alderman or your mayor or something. She said, well, I'm not Norman Lear, I'm Claire Lear. And this is, uh, that was the first time I said what I'm saying now. I said, Claire, with everything you think about what I may have done and everything you've done, she never left Newington. Can you get your fingers close enough when you consider? the size of the planet and, the, and so forth, to measure anything I may have done to anything you may have done. So, I am convinced we're all responsible for doing as much as I may have accomplished. Uh, it's a, I, I understand what you're saying. It's but, an articulate but you, deflection. But, but you have to think about the, you have to really buy into the size and scope of the creator's enterprise here. But here on this planet, you have really, really mattered. I'm a son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one more question for you. Yeah. How old do you feel? I am, the, I am the peer of whoever I'm talking to. Well, I feel 93. <laughs> <laughs> we out of here. Well, I feel 93 years old, but I hope to one day feel as young as the person I'm sitting across from. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Norman Lear. Oh, oh we earned it. Thank you.